Welcome to our webinar today, Harnessing the Power of Digital Assets and Blockchain in 2024, Strategies for Traditional uh, Finance. My name is Doug Schwank from Digital Asset Research, and I'm pleased to uh, be the moderator uh, with two great panelists, uh, Sergey Nazaroff from Chainlink and Sandy Call from Franklin Templeton. We are here to talk about how banks, asset managers, and other financial institutions of every stripe uh, can strategically implement digital assets and blockchain technology and what this year ahead uh, holds for us. Sandy, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and then Sergey? It's nice to be here with Sergey. It's nice to have everyone in the audience joining. Um, my name is Sandy Call. I am the head of industry advisory services at Franklin Templeton. Um, we look at thought leadership on how the investment and wealth management industries are evolving and changing. And I also am fortunate enough to be the head of strategy for our digital asset unit inside Franklin Templeton, which is one of the market leading offerers of digital services right now uh, in the ecosystem. So happy to talk about our journey, what we are doing, where we see the world heading, and very excited to be here with Sergey. Um, I pointed out to Sergey just before we began that I have been invested in and following Chainlink since it emerged and think it is extraordinary. So I'll turn it over to him. Great. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, so I'm Sergey. I'm a co-founder of uh, Chainlink. I've been in the smart contract uh, industry for over well over 10 years, building the kind of, I think, newest things that, that come out from uh, an application Point of view initially, and then switching to infrastructure, and very excited to see experienced, thoughtful people like Sandy doing so many great things for our industry. So, Sandy, thank you so much for joining us here in this talk and all the things you're doing to move the the entire blockchain industry forward. Uh, frankly, uh, very excited to 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 hear and discuss your views here with everyone. Let's get started with the blockchain and digital asset opportunity. Uh, Sandy, you've been at the forefront of the digital asset re revolution, uh, both at Franklin Templeton and before. Um, how and why is Franklin Templeton adopting blockchain tech? Yeah, so we really started in the blockchain space back in 2017 at Franklin Templeton. And, and we started from a very simple premise, right? Uh, our CEO, Jenny Johnson, had had many functions in the firm before moving into the CEO's position. Uh, and one of her main responsibilities and previous roles had been to run tech and ops for Franklin Templeton. We were our own transfer agent. Uh, we were literally doing the books and records and doing the transfer agency work on thousands of funds, which meant thousands and thousands of ledgers. And she heard about this new blockchain ledger technology and wanted the team to experiment and see, could we save money moving some of these operations onto the blockchain? It started off as just a very simple tech project. What the team found out, though, uh, especially beginning back in 2017, is that the deeper we went into the space, the more the opportunity of how this could transform not only the way we do operations, but the entire industry uh, became clearer and clearer. So we started, uh, and there was, at that point, there was no wallet system that existed where we could do KYC AML. So we built a wallet system. Uh, we built our own blockchain-based transfer agency system. We realized in doing this that to record transactions on a blockchain, we needed to have tokens of that blockchain to pay for our transactions. So we started needing to manage these tokens in our treasury which in turn meant that we needed to understand the tokenomics of the supply and the demand on the tokens because we wanted to be able to manage those supplies in our treasury. And then we started really understanding what the protocols were doing in the transaction space, particularly as we expanded across different chains, uh, because we realized that to be a participant in the space, you need to do your node verification. So we started verifying trades in the networks where we operated. And all of this gave us insights into how powerful the innovation coming out of the ecosystem has been. And we had launched initially a government, U.S. government money market fund as our test case because it had actions that were administered each day, right? Each day you pay a yield. 
on the money market fund. So we thought this was a great test case. We were also a little lucky because interest rates were at zero when we first decided to tokenize our money market fund. And so having that tokenized money market fund in this latest period when interest rates went up was very fortuitous for us. Uh, but it was that experience and launching that chain that really made us huge believers in the opportunity in the space. And so we built out our own investment research team who are doing coin level research at this point. We have 11 different model portfolios that we're trading with live track records that have between 18 and 30 coins in each portfolio. Uh, we have a blockchain-based venture capital fund that we're trading. Um, we're doing our own staking on networks that require staking. Um, and we have recently launched our Bitcoin ETF and filed for an Ether ETF. So we're very active in the space. We see lots of opportunity forthcoming in both traditional assets and new crypto assets. Uh, and we couldn't be more excited about the future. Sergey, you've been doing this about as long as financial institutions have been involved in blockchain. How have you seen the financial institutions you work with evolve their digital asset strategy over the past few years? Yeah, uh, thank you. I've seen a lot of evolution. I mean, just just very quickly, one of the things I'd like to say is I feel that um, both Sandy's understanding and Franklin Templeton's progress in the in the capital markets and the asset management industry is is actually very far ahead of of what I see in 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 terms of a lot of the other people in that industry. They are, I would say, at the very very top and the cutting edge of everything she described. Um, and I think it's great to see someone of their size and reputation and stature and kind of brand recognition doing that to that degree of technical involvement in our industry. So um, I just want to kind of clarify that. Unfortunately, Sandy and Franklin Templeton are a bit of um, of a unique case right now. Um, not not everyone is as involved or or, or informed or or integrated into blockchain technology as they are, um, which is which is it's still great to see that that's where they are. What what I've seen is that people are a few years away from like maybe de depending on the folks a year or more away from where Sandy and Franklin Templeton are in, mo in the vast majority of cases, and to to get there they'd have to make a very significant investment. Um, the the thing that I've seen evolve over the years is at first the story was that cryptocurrencies would become regulated out of existence. That's that was the first story. Then once you crossed, I think, 200 billion in market cap, I think people became kind of cognizant that something can't continue to exist for this long and be at 200 billion if it doesn't make sense. So I think there was a kind of tipping point when the value in the industry went, went to a certain level. Then everyone began engaging in custody, right? So a number of custody solutions uh, appeared. You know, BitGo is a good example. Others are good examples where custody solutions appeared, started offering software, to various capital markets participants, some of the capital markets participants built their own custody solutions um, and, and became good at that. But that was the next step, is custodying other people's tokens. And that is kind of the stage that I would say we're in the middle of. We're not in the early days of custody. We're in the middle of custody. The late stages of custody are when I think the more advanced custody institutions begin to provide their own custody services for blockchain. So everyone that does traditional custody will eventually provide crypto custody, whether they reskin a uh, custody software provider, whether they build their own or whatever. So I would say we're in the middle to maybe middle late stages of the custody side of how the, cha the, the chain um, ecosystem is being interacted with, with the capital markets. And we're in the very early stages, the very, very beginning stages of what is now being referred to as tokenization or real world assets. Um, those are the two most common terms I, I hear now. The evolution there is that, okay, we've done custody of other people's assets. How do we get involved in composing or even creating new on-chain assets, right? So, so where everything is, is now is that the promise of blockchain technology is starting to become delivered in the capital markets because you're generating assets and you're packaging those assets into more and more advanced financial products. And those assets might not be cryptocurrencies. So now there might, the, these assets might be asset manager generated or bank generated, or but they're natively capital market generated. And then the capital markets will flow them into various places where consumers can interact with them. So 
So the issuance or the creation of the asset process, I think, is now in the process of flipping from the majority of assets being made on public chains by startup teams to a lot of the assets being made by capital markets, uh, participants, asset managers, banks, and so on, because fundamentally, that's what they do, right? They they take assets and they wrap them in, in, in various legal and technical frameworks to allow the global financial markets to interact with them. This is this is what the global financial industry does. So I think we're at the very, very early stages of that. And you know, people like Sandy are really kind of trailblazing where where that's going. Let's move on to the uh, state of adoption. Um, Sandy, what industry trends excite you the most for 2024? So I, I think Sergey hit on the biggest, which is, you know, this idea that for the first time it is really dawning on the majority of the traditional investment management and traditional banking systems um, that these rails create all new opportunities for us, right? And that people are now beginning to make those plans and embrace the technology. Um, and this was something, you know, that we should have seen coming. We kind of see this trend happen over and over with very new technologies taking a little bit of time for their potential to be understood by the financial industry. We saw the same thing with cloud technologies. I remember having many, many conversations, some of them even with you, Doug, uh, with firms about you know, why it was going to be beneficial for financial services to take advantage of cloud-based service-based offerings. Um, that is so commonplace now, it's hard to remember that those conversations even took place. Uh, but they did, and we're at that point in the cycle again now, uh, where I think Sergey completely identified the tipping point, which is we issue assets, right? We issue assets, we trade assets, we put assets into portfolios, we wrap portfolios in different wrappers to make them accessible uh, to investors. And when you think about the way in which we do that, the market infrastructure on which we have been doing that is 50 years old, right? We came out with all of the processes that kind of define today's financial market infrastructure back in the early 1970s. And though we've added better computing power uh, and more service-based ways of accessing those services, it is still the same set of services that we've been performing for 50 years. Uh, and what we are starting to see with the blockchain technologies is there are ways to improve that tremendously, right? There are ways to cut the processing times to get more real-time information. There are ways to enable 24 by 7 by 365 trading because we live in a global world. Our businesses operate in global worlds, and we should be able to trade portfolios in global worlds around the clock. Uh, we are looking at new ways of kind of now exchanging assets uh, in a manner that brings together cash and securities that has never really existed in the same formulation of being able to really think of these as completely transferable securities in the moment. And we are starting to put assets into common holding structures called wallets. And if you think about the complexity of account structures today, um, that's a huge improvement just in and of itself. So I think that the biggest trend for 2024 is just as Franklin Templeton did on our journey, I think a lot of firms, as they start to partake in these um, explorations, which start off with perhaps a very modest goal, right? We started off with a very modest goal. Um, but what happens is, is I think the more you engage in this space, the greater the opportunity set becomes because you're better, your understanding becomes. And that's where I think you're going to see a lot of progress made in 2024. Um, I've seen even in just the last six months, the level of understanding and excitement and expansive thinking from my peers that I speak with has moved tremendously. So I think we're going to see a lot of excitement a lot of building and a lot of new opportunities emerge in the coming year. There's one thing I know about you, Sandy, is you always see the curve and you're out in front of it. Uh, so excited to uh, hear that from you. Uh, Sergey, how is Chainlink helping institutions navigate the fragmentation within the expanding multi-chain landscape? Sure. So there's there's three fundamental um, problems that that firms will face as they um, reach Sandy's level 
and you know, and everyone together with Sandy goes even beyond that level is is basically three fundamental problems. The first technical problem will be around data. Will be how to convey data into all of these tokenized assets. That'll be the first fundamental problem because the tokenized asset needs the data to function, just like DeFi needs the data to function. It's it's basically the same technical situation exactly. Without certain pieces of data, you won't actually be able to make the asset function correctly. And I personally think that in the capital markets, you need much more data because there's more requirements, like identity requirements and others. So the flow of data to assets needs to actually increase for the capital markets to properly tokenize things, the quality of data, the security of the data, and so on. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the cross-chain connectivity problem. Basically, how do you connect all of the assets, all of the liquidity on all of the different chains across various chain technologies into a single asset that uh, wants people to purchase it, right? So if your asset is on a public chain and there's a bunch of liquidity on other public chains, how does all that liquidity access your asset once you've properly made it using the right code and the right data? So now you've made the asset, um, you've connected it to the other assets and other public and private and various chains. Now you're kind of in a situation where the asset can be purchased and moved. It can be moved to the counterparties chain. It can be moved to a custody chain. It can be moved to another public chain. It can be moved to any number of places. And this is where you reach the third problem of keeping all the information updated. So this third problem is a problem um, people other than Sandy and, and a few select others in the blockchain industry that aren't as advanced are not very familiar with yet. But the reality is that if you're in a fragmented multi-blockchain world, whether that's a public blockchain world, a private chain world, or probably a mixed world, you, you end up with a data problem, then you end up with a cross-chain problem, then you end up with a cross-chain data problem, basically. And what, what Chainlink is doing, has been doing now for years, is providing all of the data that powers the vast majority of, of on-chain applications. Now with CCIP and the cross-chain capabilities of, of uh, both the data and uh, value messaging movement uh, mechanism, you can now solve not only the data problem, not only the cross-chain problem, but also the cross-chain data problem. And you actually have to solve all three of these problems because if you tokenize something and then you connect it to somewhere else and then you move it somewhere else, if that thing doesn't continue to remain updated, then it loses um, its ability to function correctly. And also when you move it to other places, you, you wanna do it in the least friction, least costly way possible from an integrations point of view. And that actually increases the amount of counterparties that you can have for it, which is you know, the way that we're fundamentally trying to accelerate the adoption of, of blockchain technology in the capital markets is by solving those three problems. And because Chainlink is the only system that actually does cross-chain and data at the level of security and speed and, and connectivity that it does, I think that at the moment, at least, Chainlink is the only system that solves the third cross-chain data problem, which is a critical requirement for assets that work across chains. It's not just moving a data-enriched asset, it's moving it and allowing it to continue functioning as a data-enriched asset. Sandy, the uh, spot Bitcoin ETF is taking all the oxygen out of the uh, the room these days, or it, or it has for a while, um, and you've been at the forefront of that with... Um, Franklin's offering. How does that expand the marketplace, this US uh, spot Bitcoin ETF uh, for investment? And related to that, how does adding Bitcoin to a portfolio change things? Does that have impacts on our traditional allocation uh, models? Yeah, so it's been a, a very exciting time uh, these last few weeks. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen anything like the launch of the Spot Bitcoin ETF, where you had 10 different firms literally launching a brand new product that had never really existed before simultaneously uh, with a whole SEC countdown and hacking. It was very exciting. We'll probably make movies about it. Um, but what I think has gotten sometimes missed in the excitement over the actual launch has been why? Why is this such an important product for the marketplace? And I think it's important on two fronts. Number one, 
It's important because Bitcoin has been the best performing asset class in eight of the last 10 years, right? It's important because Bitcoin was the originator of blockchain uh, and the originator of some of the new practices uh, that have become commonplace in the crypto domain. And it was hard to invest in that innovation because of the way that you needed to invest in Bitcoin through a either regular uh, through either a centralized or a decentralized exchange, and you needed to hold the asset in a wallet, right? So it was an unusual way of accessing a new technology. Compare that to when ChatGPT came out last year, the money that flowed into these AI stocks because people understood that that company, those companies that originated these early LMM models and these early AI offerings were of huge potential value because of their innovative importance, right? Bitcoin never got the benefit of seeing that innovative importance because it was very hard to trade. Now it is becoming much easier to trade. And the reason that's important is because Bitcoin really is going to be seen as history as introducing the pivot point from today's platform economy, which I think everyone on this call is very familiar with, and many of the firms on this call have made a lot of money by participating in the platform economy. But the launch of Bitcoin really marked the pivot to what we are calling the protocol economy. And this protocol economy offers a very different value proposition, right? In the traditional platform economy, you invested into the company that built the platform, that attracted the users, and that created network effects, right? So you are buying the company based on the value proposition of it could create network effects and benefit from that. But now with the protocol economy of which Bitcoin was the originator, right, you are buying the network. You are buying the network effects. You are buying the network. And I think that is such an advancement in the investment hypothesis. But so many people have lost that because they got very caught up in the mechanics of the early Bitcoin trading, the difficulty of accessing it. So as a product, the Bitcoin ETF is going to now uh, have a place in portfolios because of its spectacular performance and its speculative performance in the past. But in doing so, it's going to open up the real story of innovation of why is Bitcoin having that type of performance and what is it enabling? And I think people will really start to internalize, we as investment managers, particularly who are always looking for that next growth opportunity for our clients, it will start to recognize um, that this is the pivot that we've been waiting for to the next economy, which is going to be the protocol economy. Um, so that's why it's going to be in history so important. In present, it's also so important because we have heard over and over about the need for diversification into alternatives in individual and wealth portfolios. Uh, alternatives have been difficult to access because of the liquidity structure. Even some of the newer retail-focused offerings have liquidity issues associated with them for smaller accounts, whereas crypto and Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ETF is something very liquid that can now play the role of that alternative exposure in many accounts. So that's the short-term case, but the longer-term case of why this is such an important moment is going to be that it is really going to now open up the story of innovation that blockchain kicked off and the story of this pivot to the protocol economy uh, in a way that I think investors will really be able to internalize and understand. Let's move on to some uh, financial services adoption use cases. Um, Sandy, what does blockchain technology make possible for the asset management industry? So first off, it makes possible a whole new type of interoperability between assets, right? Uh, today, when I think about using one of my assets uh, and using it as either collateral or using it um, to create leverage or using it to borrow or to lend or using it uh, to engage with another counterparty, there's a lot of frictions that go along with that process, right? And there's a lot of timing delays. The contracts that I agree to sit separately from the assets and the systems that are moving the assets. There's a lot of difficulty. Uh, we make it work, but we make it work a little bit with chewing gum uh, and with uh, sticks, right? 
what this enables is this to really operate as an effective, smooth system, right? Smart contracts that Sergey had mentioned earlier are so critical, right? I mean, my aha moment about this whole space came when I realized that I could now embed the contract that governs the asset's activities into the asset itself and that the contract would move with the asset, right? Just think about that and all the problems that that solves in today's financial ecosystem. That is what we are starting to enable and that is what Sergey's team is starting to enable. And that's going to allow for things like intraday repo, intraday short flash type lending, uh, ability to actually now start to use assets interoperably between each other in different ways in the wallet to optimize your asset holdings. Uh, just like we today sweep certain uh, unused cash from an account, a fund account into a money market fund and then back the next day, we're going to have many more types of these types of processes that are going to enable intraday efficiencies and 24-7, 365 efficiencies that will allow us to operate over weekends and overnight in off geographies. These are going to all be enabled because these new technologies can operate in a way that is semi-automated, uh, where once the contract is properly set up, it's going to be able to be executing even when there's not someone deliberately overseeing it. And I think that opens up huge potential. Uh, for the industry. So I think you're going to see it primarily in financing, um, in the near term financing and in efficiencies around settlements and in efficiencies around capital utilization and in efficiencies about collateral optimization. Sergey, did you want to jump in on this question as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Just just to really echo what Sandy was was saying, I think the composability um, is is quite a huge advancement in how people can package together various different assets. And I think there eventually will be this wave of uh, mass personalization where people can select multiple different assets from multiple different chains, multiple different places, and compose them into a kind of personalized fund. And I think the mass personalization dynamic is an important consumer dynamic in the asset management world that blockchains are going to make possible on the back end. So as a backend technology, the, uh, instead of having to take three months to organize a fund, to verify the assets, to get them together, to get it through compliance, to get it through legal, to get it to, to whatever other process that, that needed to happen, now you just have all these pre-verified, pre-approved assets with all their information, and you need all you really need to do is make a contract that composes them into, into a tokenized uh, fund. That is still years away because the assets need to get on chain and the connectivity between the chains need to, needs to mature and all of this stuff all needs to happen. But I think the composability is, uh, is, is indeed an often un un underappreciated aspect. Um, and then there's also the efficiency aspect, which when you look at the numbers in the capital markets, I don't think people fully understand how much interest you get if you are able to take custody of cash a day sooner when the amount of, ca of cash is $10 billion, right? It, it might not matter if it's $10 and that doesn't matter, but um, if it's $10 billion, then it matters quite a bit because even, even that one day difference of how you manage that collateral and, and the interest you get on it is, is a large financial line item that only a few people understand in 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 terms of the people who actually do these things and as i work with them more and learn more about that the incentives become very clear to me uh, for both of you um let's drill down a bit more on interoperability um how does interoperability play a key role in enabling the asset management industry to use blockchains successfully uh sergey you want to you want to start sure th thanks so I, I think interoperability comes down to a question of liquidity. And there's a debate um, about where the liquidity will be. Will the liquidity be in public chains or private chains or what, what chains will it be in, basically? From, from my point of view, um, there'll be liquidity in both places initially. There'll be liquidity in public chains and there'll be liquidity in private chains. And the real goal of interoperability is to generate maximum access to liquidity. 
across all of these places. Because the goal of all the tokenized assets is simply to participate in the market, to participate in the largest market that they can participate in in a compliant, uh, efficient way. So the, the key role that interoperability plays for me is, is this ability to generate counterparty connections that essentially results in, in buying or selling of the asset. Eventually, I think very robust interoperability creates cross-chain secondary markets. And the cross-chain secondary markets drive um, the incentives to create even more assets and put even more assets into those places. And you know that's something that's that's also now very 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 early. Um, and then there's always the ever prevalent data problem of how all the data moves along with all the assets as they're changing hands, whether it's through a direct transaction or a secondary market exchange, or or whatever the method is. The, the second problem is actually a problem of synchronization. And the synchronization problem actually is bi-directional. So it's both keeping the assets updated on as they go to the various chains, but also keeping the systems in the banks and the asset management companies, in the central securities, uh, depository systems, in the regulator systems, and everyone's systems updated about the status of the assets as they move across all these different chain environments so that they can manage them properly. So I think interoperability is a, is a necessary, is definitely a necessary condition for the real growth of, um, of both the Web3 use cases and the capital markets use cases. And eventually I just see it all becoming one big internet of contracts. Sandy, anything you would uh, add to that? Yeah, so first off, I 100% agree with Sergey. In I, I think that the liquidity and the synchronization is is super critical. The one thing I would add to it, from having had the experience with Franklin of having really built now uh, within multiple ecosystems and multiple blockchains, um, is that there's also I think a, a foundational misunderstanding about how security changes when you move into these blockchain-based ecosystems, right? We as an industry have built technology from the point of view of we need to control the data, we need to control the permissioning of accounts and who gets to see data. Uh, and this has been in part because the systems we have built have been built in a way um, to be the aggregator and the holder of those data records. There is no single record uh, of every transaction, because even when you go to the depositories, they're only doing the book entry form and then the individual accounts are held uh, within the different participants. So there is no global view of our books and records in this industry. Um, and so I think that when people think about the future, they think, oh, well, I need to build this capability and I need to do it as part of either a private chain or a permissioned chain so that I can control the data and I can control um, you know, the, the ability to access uh, and participate in the system. And let's be real, to also can hold some of our edge because we don't want to be disintermediated. Um, but I think what the missing understanding is, is that you are building a system that is going to be highly vulnerable if you go into these permissioned pools or into these private blockchains, because the number of developers that you have working on your security model, the number of nodes that you have actually doing verification is going to be far, 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 far fewer than any public blockchain, even new and beginning public blockchains. And those public blockchains are going to have higher levels of security than any private offering being built by anyone in the industry, simply because there's thousands upon thousands of developers that are constantly testing the security of these protocols, right? So I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding that private somehow equals safer. And I think that we will see that understanding begin to change as more people build in the space. And I think what will also happen, as Sergey said, is that all these private chains are eventually going to have to connect into the public records uh, because there will be one major set of records for everything in the industry. What Sergey said is exactly right. We are going to have a master golden copy of contracts 
that will pull together all these sources of liquidity. And competing in a private chain is going to result, as uh, I think Sergey pointed out, the liquidity of private chains is going to shrink and shrink and shrink as people begin to understand that these public chains offer better uh, optionalities and better security. And they actually reward you for participating in their ecosystem. So simply building the network and trying to control it, that was almost an interim phase. We're moving into a phase where those networks are going to be publicly shared and hold the records for everyone. It may take us a few years to get there. There may be a transition path where we start with a lot of private chains and we start with permit, public permission side chains. Uh, but where we feel it's going to move over time is going to be everything's going to be on public chains. It's going to be very affordable to do the operational piece of your business. Uh, and that's going to be a benefit to all of us. So that, that's kind of where we see the world headed. You've both talked about the importance of tokenization as a theme uh, for this year and, and the future. Let's drill down on that a bit more. Um, what do you think is next for tokenization in capital markets and asset management uh, specifically? Um, Sergey, let's uh, let's start with you. Sure. Th thank you. One, one thing I'd like to just quickly say is I really applaud, um, Sandy, your understanding and focus on security. And I think it's it's a it's a it's a real outgrowth of your dealing with the realities of how to secure value and how to deal with the value of users. And I think that's absolutely the right point of view and the same point of view that everyone's going to arrive at that the security of of the systems controlling and moving and providing data and providing connectivity and providing the record itself is is a critical aspect of how technologies will be evaluated. And um, so, so I, I really applaud you for thinking about the security considerations of how value is secured. My experience is that that is where people that really do secure value and deal with actual production systems ends up because they, it has to end up there because they're responsible for that value and they have to understand the security dynamics of these systems. So I, I think that that's a very thoughtful view. It's the view I, I see every, people in Web3 and Every, anyone who have ever secured value arrives at this view because they kind of have to have to have an informed view on security. So I, I think that's definitely the right foundational kind of principle around which to to make decisions on how these golden records and the contracts work. So very very much in agreement with that. Um, in in terms of tokenization, what I see next, I think there's really two categories, and it it partly depends on the firm's appetite for doing new things versus existing categories of assets that they are very well known and entrenched in. Sometimes firms even do both. The new things are new categories of assets which have not already been packaged and wrapped within the current asset management landscape. So these are things like carbon credits, which as an asset class recently emerged. Uh, real estate is a good example where there's still a lot of packaging that can happen. Uh, tokenizing private equity is a good example. That's not a commonly, you know, tradable, transferable product. These are kind of examples at the edges of the asset management industry that could be big, big booming markets if only they became more transferable, portable, easier to access, more um, fractionally ownable, all these types of properties. And then you have the core asset management business, which is, you know, the treasuries, the bonds, the portfolios of, of certain blue chip stocks and other things, and packaging those into a tokenized form, basically to create a superior collateral, uh, a more efficient form of collateral, a more easily transferable form of collateral, a more um, reusable for various purposes form of collateral. Those are those are the two uh, the two groups. I think both of those groups will emerge, but I, I actually do not know right now. It's very hard for me to tell which of those two groups will be the booming initial market for capital markets and asset asset management tokenization? Sandy. Yeah, I think uh, Sergey so brings up some great examples. Um, I think I'd add a, a few more as well for folks to think about. Um, I think one of the things that you're likely to see more of is direct bond issuance, right? I think that there's a huge opportunity through tokenization for smaller 
uh, companies to be issuing bonds for more issuance of green bonds um, in smaller denominations. These are often issuances that it is not as economically advantageous for uh, the traditional issuers to engage in. Uh, but there is growing demand for these types of issues. There's some super interesting examples out there. Uh, there's even an example of a Japanese department store that issued a green bond to its credit card holders, right? To the people who held credit cards in the department store. Uh, and they were able to pay out the yield on those green bonds 70% uh, in loyalty points on the credit card and 30% in cash. So very creative new ways that we can use this to open up the issuance opportunity to a broader set, I, I think, of providers that in some ways have difficulty accessing the capital markets uh, in today's formulation. I also think that there are this category of assets that have been for many years investable, uh, but they're very hard to trade. Right. And when you think about that, I think about things like royalty rights to songs. Right. It's very hard to imagine being able to administer the royalty rights to a song across millions of investment holders. Right. Simply the operational complexity of that task would have taken hundreds and hundreds of people. And by the time the process got done, you were up to the next uh, distribution of royalties and you would always be falling a little bit behind the curve. But with new smart contracts and, and the ability to programmatically put in the execution of the distributions, we can see that starting to happen. So assets like this, assets that have been investable, but very hard to trade because they have not been able to easily be incorporated into portfolios from a, a participation perspective or an operational perspective, I think you're going to see more of those new types of assets begin to be launched uh, and, and offered to clients because they work so well in the new environment. Let's move on uh, and talk uh, a bit uh, about some uh, key considerations for unlocking uh, opportunities. Sergey, how does Chainlink enable uh, a golden record for institutions transacting with digital assets across different systems? Sure, absolutely. I, I think this is a very important and not fully understood understood part of, of what's going on here on an efficiency level. I'm also really interested to hear Sa Sandy's views on this as, as, the, as, as the value of this from, from the point of view of an asset manager. But but my my view is that a lot of the systemic financial risk, a lot of the individual financial risk of any asset is because there's a lot of information that's siloed away from holders of the asset. They basically cannot stay necessarily up to date with everything going on with the asset. And, and this unified golden record concept for me really delivers on the ability to do better risk management. So if there's anything that changes about an asset, well, initially building the unified golden record is about designing something that if somebody held that container that, that kind of smart contract as a container of information, they could know everything they need to know about that asset without having to contact anyone. So, so they would be able to manage their risk. One of the examples that always comes to mind for me is the 2008 financial crisis where there were all these individual mortgage holders. And then if each of those individual mortgage holders had their own smart contract that was then rolled up into a basket, then anybody could do diligence on every individual mortgage holder and understand basic things like, well, how many houses does this person have? How many mortgages do they have? How much you know, ballpark do they earn? You don't even need to know their name. You just need to know these properties about what's making up the asset. So what, what the unified golden record does is it creates this on-chain asset, this on-chain piece of data, uh, data, this data container, it injects it with various critical information. Like if you have a real estate token, you would want to know if there's any liens on the property. You would want to know if the property owes any debts and someone could repossess the property. And if that changes, right? So if all of a sudden there's a lien put on the property that's tokenized, you want to know those things because it's a significant change in the risk profile of that asset. And that should be reflected in the on-chain record. And so... The real challenge here is how do you make these unified golden records that answer everyone's risk questions? And then how do you keep that unified golden record in sync and unified across chains and, and, and keep it all updated? But I think the unified golden record, even beyond the ability 
to you know float the capital better or to manage the collateral better or to or to use it as a source of payment for the DVP or whatever. Um, I think you actually get this very big risk management benefit where you can proactively detect what's going on with assets in ways that eliminate this this kind of siloing and opaqueness of information that causes these big systemic issues um, and also individual financial risk issues. Yeah, I think you're exactly correct. Um, I, I like the analogy I like to use here is think about, for those old enough to actually even remember it, think about pre-internet, how hard was it to book a vacation to a foreign country, right? You had to call up multiple travel agents, you didn't know what the restaurants were in the country you were going to. You had no access to how to make reservations other than calling every individual restaurant and asking them their schedules, right? And then think about today, how easy it is to plan a trip using online tools through the internet and through the platforms that are being provided. And now think about what the next step in that evolution is going to be. If you say, I want to plan a vacation to X, you will be able through these types of golden contracts, uh, this is really you know, the analogy I'm trying to draw here, all that information will be at your fingertips, right? All the travel schedules, all of the restaurants, all of the tour agencies, all of the local customs and protocols, all of the hotel recommendations and reviews, everything will be available for you to look at just upon one request. That is what this unified golden record is going to look like. And along with it is going to be something along the lines of a token that verifies my identity that I can exchange at the time of a transaction for someone to have complete faith in the KYC AML and my ability to do that transaction. All of the information is in the contract that moves with the asset as part of the transaction. And therefore, all of that information and all of the ability to utilize that information to make smarter decisions is going to be at our fingertips. And that is the power of this protocol economy, because it's all callable and it's all programmable and it can all be loaded into a contract uh, that can be exchanged between counterparties. That's all you're going to need to exchange is the contract. It's going to have everything you need in it to actually then operationalize the acceptance and the implementation of that contract. You've both talked a little bit about the role of public versus private blockchains and some of the benefits uh, uh, therein uh, of making a decision one way or the other. But for firms that are thinking about blockchain technology, how would you, what would you advise them to do and, and how would you suggest the, those roles are going to evolve uh, in the in the next um, uh, year, two years, uh, five years, whatever time frame you're comfortable with. Um, Sandy, I know you've got some some great opinions. Maybe we could start with you. Well, I would say start, right? Just start. Start by experimenting in the space. Start with something small. Figure out a test trade that you would like to do. And then try that test trade with a private network. There's several private networks that are easy to join now uh, that are looking for participants to try and try that same trade with a public network, right? There's all of these big public blockchains have development teams that will work with you, that will help you try and implement uh, a test trade, just like the offerers of private blockchains have teams that can stand by to help you. And then Determine how it worked for you, what worked well, what was an advantage relative to what you're doing today, right? That's how we started. We really started with a very simple premise of, will it cost us less to keep our books and records on a public blockchain? Uh, and the answer we came to from that initial question was very, very much so and very, very much less, right? But that started our journey. And, and the way to really get comfortable in this space is to start your journey, and start with something small, try it in a couple different venues because there's many venues looking to compete for liquidity now. So you can try it in a different type of venue and you can get a sense for what feels like it's gonna work best for your organization. Um, regulators too are doing a lot of experimentation now. Many, I think, participants in the ecosystem that have private chains now will transition those chains to public chains when the regulations enable it. Um, because they've had these experiences and they've built in the space. 
but they're still private today. So they're still a safe venue to try things. So I think that the most important first step is to get in there and start to engage in the ecosystem. That is how you really start to internalize all of these exciting benefits that Sergey and I have been talking about. You don't really, I think intellectually, it's hard to grasp them, but when you actually start to operate in the environment, it really becomes clear so quickly why it is superior to what we're able to do today. Sergey. Yeah, so c completely, completely agree with that approach. That that I think is the right thoughtful approach to just kind of try out both both paths and understand how they relate to to your uh, to your use case and your counterparties. Um, I think what I find people doing correctly when they do this well is to find a use case that they're interesting so interested in. So, Sandy, your use case that you just described of you know can we deal with books and records a certain way is a very specific initial and very good question, right? And I, I think that finding um, a counterparty or a transaction type or an asset type or basically a transaction that you wanna do of some kind or, or some kind of specific problem to solve is, is usually a good path. Sometimes the market pulls that out of firms because their counterparties come to, say, come to them and say, hey, I'd like you to do a transaction with me. This is what I think happened with custody where a bunch of people's clients showed up and said, I'd like you to custody things for me. But then there are other cases where now there are digital asset teams within these firms. And their job, in my opinion, is to find those transactions that they can execute with a counterparty, um, whether that's as uh, an asset manager transaction or a bank-related transaction or whatever whatever the transaction have, could be the issuance of something so that other people could come and, and get access to it. Um, I think... Each of those private and public chains both have their, their own benefits and their own costs, and the dynamics there will definitely become more efficient. So I think the ability to use, use both of them will become more efficient. And then eventually, I think we'll end up at a kind of internet of contracts, just like we have the internet, right? So the internet is a bunch of different database technologies, all kinds of technologies that people essentially connect through a set of protocols to form the internet. And those technologies that they're connecting become more and more efficient. Um, and then they, they also use some of those technologies to collaborate within those places. So I, I think there'll definitely be a lot of public chain um, collaboration. And then there'll probably still be some categories of transactions that people wanna do on private chains because they need the privacy or they need some property. But, but eventually the efficiency of public chains and the ability to transact will, will, will all, go, all, all go towards the same internet of contracts. Um, I think it'll actually probably vary by transaction type is, is where I think it might end up. And also where the secondary markets form for a lot of these assets. So if those secondary markets form in one place, I think there'll be a lot of transactional throughput to that place and then back out to the, to the places where people want to store the assets or custody the assets, whatever those incentives might, might end up being from, from public chains. So I think we're, we're pretty much on the, on the same page. Let's uh, get in one last fun question from the audience. Uh, Sandy, um, Franklin, Templeton's, uh, Franklin Templeton's X account was taken over um, by, uh, uh, by something. T tell us what happened and, and what was the... Uh, what was the reasoning? Well, so I think what hopefully has come through in the in the conversation today is that our firm really does operate like a digital native within the digital ecosystem. Um, we work with firms like Sergey's firm. We work with digital native firms all the time to deliver what we're delivering. Um, and this was a big moment for that digital ecosystem to really have that recognition. Um, and so, you know, we were very excited about our role in being part of seeing this happen on both sides, our traditional asset side uh, and our digital asset side. And we thought it would be fun to let our digital asset team have a couple hours to really run the corporate account and really be able uh, to share with the very active, you know, ecosystem of the Twitterverse, uh, you know, with the crypto Twitterverse, uh, the excitement about a traditional asset manager who has part of the ecosystem, part of their partnerships, being able to celebrate that, not just within 
you know, the digital channels, but really letting that cross over into the broader channel, just like the Bitcoin ETF is allowing the ecosystem to cross over into uh, the traditional financial portfolio. So to us, it was part of our Bitcoin launch that really wanted to recognize uh, and show that these worlds are coming together. Um, and we're going to, you know, we saw so much success from it and we're going to continue to do things like this and, and let other groups also take over our corporate Twitter account to really enjoy celebrating their successes and their products. So to us, this was a real recognition of the worlds coming together and our ability to show that we operate on both sides of that, uh, on both sides of the ecosystem. We are at time. I think this has been a very interesting dialogue. Hopefully, all the attendees got uh, a good exposure to um, what's happening uh, next. Any closing thoughts uh, either of you want to share before we wrap up, uh, Sergey, uh, Sandy? I, I think this has been great. It's always a pleasure to chat with Sandy. She has very, very thoughtful, very experienced views. Um, as I said, I think that the intersection of her experience and the the path that she's been on with digital assets at Franklin Templeton is kind of unique. But I think there will be people that will see like Sandy getting to that level. But by then, well, where Sandy will be, I don't know. By then, I think I'll be I'll be asking Sandy what's next. But I, I think it's a it's a great chat, and I really um, appreciate all the thoughtful, clear, candid discussion. And also want to thank you, Doug, uh, for helping us put this together and making everything work. And I think it's I think it's been a great discussion. So I'm thrilled about this. I, I will tell you, for 20 years I've gone to Sandy to ask what's next. So I think you're right, Sergey. She will be telling us. Well, I think what's next and what we did here today is a perfect example of that because the the innovation and the real willingness to rethink the model that Chainlink represents and the ability to bring that in a controlled and regulated way into the broader financial system and work with firms like ours, Doug, um, and like yours is gonna be the future for all of us. So it's exciting to really now start to see these connections and see these shared pieces of expertise being brought together. So thank you so much for uh, the conversation today. I enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.